Skype and Gravity will be a mixture of moving sound and image, some strong interaction, highly immersive. It will ask a lot of questions, leave people leaving asking questions, I hope, about their own identity. Perhaps it will be a, an artwork that they've never seen anything like before. I think we felt that this was one of those hidden histories for Bedford where the Cardington sheds themselves loom very much on the skyline as you approach and anyone who's driven past them or been a resident here will have known them. But now, 90 years on from that Imperial Airship program and those sheds now being used as movie studios, there's a danger actually that people are going to forget what they were there for originally, um, particularly with new residents, there's a lot of new housing in the area, and children and young people who just don't know anything about that airship heritage. But for us, it represents a symbol of Bedford's innovation history, its sense of endeavour, of you know, a strong aviation heritage that we think it should be celebrating. So yeah, it felt now at the 90th anniversary, a good time to capture memory, to get people excited, and particularly think about how we might build towards a centenary in 10 years time. Started production for Escape and Gravity, that was within lockdown. You know, effectively the collaborative artistic team all were really interested in working with games engines, working with worlds that could be created in real time. So that was a logical extension for me, as someone who really was keen to experiment in these areas, but relatively inexperienced, somehow suited making a project when we, we found it extremely difficult to get together in the same room. So to want to escape gravity is something that a lot of people can identify with. And I think that the airship program, with dirigibles being so large, you know, clearly this could capture an entire imagination globally. There is still a massive community of people that, you know, can't think of anything other than airships. I think Airships Dreams is a fantastic vehicle um, for people to get on board and look at the heritage and then look at the future, the environment, the innovation of Bedford, how people can look at the dreams of flight and make up their own ideas of what flight could have looked like if the aeroplane disappeared and there was airships in our skyline. Um, I think young and old, people from a heritage background can look at artefacts, things they might have at home, whereas younger people might look at the way the environment's changing and we're looking into different fuels and how airships again could be a realistic proposition for the future. Ten years ago we held an exhibition in one of the galleries here that looks at the story of the airship building programme at Carlington and particularly the the story of the R101 airship. That was very much a traditional museum display focused on burrowing objects that related to the history of, of the site at Cardington and to the airship program. So it's great to be able to do something different now with a contemporary artistic spin on it. Well, I think it deserves to put Bedford's airship heritage on the map. Um, I think, I, I, you know, I'm really proud of the work and I hope that it gets kind of taken on and, and, and that nationally people pay attention to it. Um, I think it's a really interesting exploration of it. I've certainly learned an awful lot through the whole process. Um, and I love the, the, the Airship Dreams exhibition as well with uh, just showing other people's fascination with the whole thing. Um, I mean, I, I, I didn't know there's a whole kind of international scene of people kind of fascinated by airship travel and things and that Bedford is, is on that map already. So can we, can we help them to, to bring it out into the wider community? I hope so. There's such a huge amount of history with Bedford and Cardington and, and the airships and actually sometimes there's that, you know, especially when the, the airships sort of aren't there anymore at the moment, you know, you don't, there's that danger that that's going to get lost. So it's lovely to see that that's been recognised and, and hopefully that that exhibition has put Bedford back on the map and people will come and, and come from all over and see it. I think both of us hope that this will begin a, maybe a, a, a larger conversation about bringing this airship history back to Bedford yeah. because it was the central sure. point there, in the world. And there are still plenty point. of people in the community that would like to see a, yeah. either a permanent airship museum within this institution or one separately. 
Well, it's not only a national disaster, because it hit headlines around the world, international and a national disaster, but it's also a poignantly local one as well. You only need to go up the road from here to see the um, memorial in Cardington Churchyard. I was an archivist at Bed's record office for many years, from 1982 to 2014, and so I thought this sounded like an interesting spin-off to what I'm doing already, because over the years I've collected a few bits and pieces which have turned up locally relating to uh, airships and the people involved. This box was made from the wood of the lift of the mooring mast of the R101 and I found it in a, a shop in Bedford in 1997. It doesn't look much but if you open it up it's space for cigarettes inside and there's a little plaque which reads airship mooring mast Cardington erected 1927 demolished 1943 this box is manufactured with material from the passenger lift and sold in aid of the Red Cross Fund. Well, two other stories relating to individuals. Um, one of them is William George uh, J. Kings, um, who was born in London in uh, 1901 and died in Bedford as recently as summer 1996. And he was a member of the Mooring Tower crew in 1930. I have a series of documents here which chart um, William's uh, career and his, his working life. First of all, he was a deck boy on the Crown of Toledo, um, a merchant vessel, in 1918. Then after that, he transferred to the Royal Air Force as a, an aero rigger between 1919 and 27. And then, most poignantly, you have his discharge from the Royal Air Force in October 1930. It says here that he was a civilian subordinate and he was a member of the mooring tower crew at the time of the R101 disaster. And he was employed as a rigger between the 2nd of August 1930 and the 31st of October 1930. And of course the latter date is significant because it was shortly after the crash of the R101 and so his services were no longer needed. And it says at the bottom, discharged in consequence of reduction of staff. I've always been interested in medals relating to the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Regiment and I just bought a single long service medal which is called the Efficiency Medal for 12 years service in the local territorials, the 5th Beds and Hearts Regiment and this one was to Edward Thomas Ruff Smith and uh, I did a bit of research on him and I found an article written by him in the Regimental Magazine for March 1930 in which he describes his experiences on the R101 during its trial flights. It's quite a curious story as to how he got on there. So he did a lot of carpentry work on the R101, which he mentions, and because he was a caterer, he was invited on board as a steward during the trial flights. And he says in the article that he jumped at the chance. And uh, rather sadly, poignantly, at the end of the article, he says, no one need have any fear of um, traveling on board the R101 because I was on board and felt entirely safe poignant words when you think what was going to happen um, seven months later. My name's Derek Binks. I'm the son of the survivor, John H. Binks. My dad was an engineer on number five car. I was three years old at the time. We lived in Sheffield. We didn't live here, so I'd, I didn't know much about airship construction or anything like that. In number five car, engineer with Mr. Bell. They, they flew together, so that when it crashed, they both got out because the water tank exploded above them. And that's how they survived. When the Bournemouth came to Cardington, he flew on it, Mr. Bell flew on it. it was Lord Ventry sponsored that, and he lived in Bournemouth, that's why it was called the Bournemouth. John and I and my wife and mum and dad Lord Ventry invited us to tea at his place and um, we saw a lot of films on German airships that were in the, you know, this is 19, 1960 odd, that's what my dad flew on. Well, that was the last airship that came up there as such. After the Bournemouth, they had Skyship up there. Skyship 500 and I think the 600. Well, I flew on the 500. I had a flight on that. You paid, I think it was about 50 pound and 
we had a flight to, I think they took us over to Stewartby and then returned. Uh, that, that's the one I flew on. My, my dad never spoke much about it at all, and that's true. He was in the choir, as we were, and every October the 5th, he used to celebrate it, with, well, honour it with the choir, you know. It hasn't changed at all, short say, really. It was a good place to grow up in. It was an estate, you know, there was, there was no pub on there, only a club. There was no shop on there, the shop was in the camp. No street lighting, that was one thing there wasn't. The street lamps were up, but they never lit them. The tenants had got to pay for them through the rates and they wouldn't do it. So they never lit them. I never saw them alight till we put some up after the war. But it was a good estate. Everybody seemed to get on with each other here. Really, I'm hoping to explore kind of the ideas around Bedford's relationship with uh, the airship industry through kind of soundscapes and community-based compositions. Some of it is quite spooky and dark and ominous and in a sense that's kind of aesthetically what I'm interested in as well so those kind of collisions between something that's kind of shiny and beautiful and new and something that's kind of dystopian so I think it's it's got both of those elements. With the airship project coming to a halt when it did it kind of left something very much unfinished and I feel that there's a, a resurgence in, in interest in airship and their green technology and, and how they can again perhaps capture the imagination of a, a new future, especially after, or hopefully after COVID, there's a new horizon for lots of things and suddenly airships are starting to feel like a very positive direction for mankind to look at new travel. In terms of the final project, it's not just about the historical detail of the airships being um, from Bedford, it's more what that signified for the region and also for a country in terms of the aspiration towards global travel, leading the world in terms of globalisation at the start of the uh, 20th century. At the moment we've been working on an arrangement of a song by local singer-songwriter Jack Sharp, so I'll be piecing together a video of, of that song, but I'm also hoping to then uh, sort of extract some audio from that and kind of delve a bit deeper and make something a bit more immersive and soundscapey uh, with the sounds that, that we gather together. I have tried to respond audio-wise to the period as well, so as part of my sound palette is using disaster records from the 1920s and 30s which dealt with uh, the numerous airship disasters that happened uh, throughout that period. There's lots of uh, disaster records which I've used as source material for some of the audio, although it becomes very abstracted, you wouldn't necessarily know they were from this period or, or indeed that they were disaster records, but when you kind of abstract from, from, from their source they become kind of ghostly memories of the 1920s. 1930s. I had a couple of practices with a very small choir um, to get that going. In the end we, we couldn't have face-to-face -face rehearsals so I've been gathering videos in and I'm gonna be using those in, in different ways. Um, I'm hoping to uh, just add them all together and generate a piece of work around that. As we move around these spaces and as an audiovisual artist I think that there's a really nice relationship with making decisions in the moment you're in reacting to the, aud to the sound and the audio that we're generating. So it becomes, you know, live, there's, there's mistakes in there, then there's moments that really work. It creates a fresh piece of work, you know, there's, it changes every time we perform it as well, which is another really appealing thing. And I think the project has really nice ways of scaling and morphing and, and def definitely developing over the years as we uh, hopefully, uh, you know, push this as far as it can go. Really interesting in terms of working with Roger as well as a collaborative composer, because we were saying the day that I think our separate voices are very much in there, but they combine to create something that's kind of more than the sum of its parts. And so yeah, I, I guess those kind of analog and digital technologies were part of that kind of humanising process and the way that we were thinking about that having kind of emotional content and, and an experience really. We were offered this amazing opportunity to take part in this project um, by Bedford Creative Arts. 
we were given so many different resources, so many different local artists to work with which were fantastic and they were all amazing particularly during lockdown when this happened so lots of plans changed and we went virtual which they still all catered for. We had science projects from local company that came in and worked with us. We also worked with historians from the Higgins Museum as well as a storyteller working with the children. So um, how I made this airship is I basically I got some bamboo sticks and I slightly bent them and added elastic bands on the end and glued them to it. And then I got like a plastic bag, like cover, and I um, like glued it, started gluing it on. And I started um, decorating it and waiting for it to dry. And I painted the bottom of my um, airship, add some screws, and that's how I made this. All of these different things came together um, and enabled us as a school to work on a school-wide project, although looking at different elements of that. So each year group had a different topic, but ultimately the main goal for everybody was to look at the R101. Personally, I thought the R101 uh, burst into flames by hitting a tower, but it actually burst into flames because of it was a rainy day which damaged a hydrogen tank. Then when it settled on a hill, it burst into flames. The R101 is 223 metres or 730 foot um, long. And it crashed in Bouvet Square in France and only six survived out of the 54 innocent lives. We focused on forces like gravity. We did a few experiments as well. We made our own straw rockets. We tried different materials to see which one would go up furthest and which one would go down lowest. She said he had to design an airship and Whoever wins gets the airship made. We, we won the, the competition. competition. This is my airship. This is my airship. It's been really exciting. The children have learnt so much and showed us as staff that they're really proud of the area that they come from. Proud of Shortstown and Cardington for building a really big airship. In some cases, they've actually taught us a lot. I know that we as a staff have learnt so much about the area that we are in and it's been a really exciting opportunity to be a part of. really emotional to see it was obviously I've grown up with that all my life at his house and seeing his shed and all of the artifacts that he'd collected and hearing his memories of the airships and, and working at the hangars it was yeah it's quite surreal to see it all there but really lovely it's lovely to be able to know that it is there for the public to come and see as well so it's amazing he shared such a passion for airship heritage during his working life had been based at Cardington and had worked there for many, many decades. He then got very involved as curator of the Airship Heritage Trust collection, which was actually rescued from various different places and contained in the, the Cardington sheds until it then went down to the Museum of the Royal Navy, which is down at Yeovilton. Dan also had his own personal collection of memorabilia and books and photographs and documentation and that was kept at his home in this shed uh, in his study and he would use that as a place where he came to meet Mike Stubbs, our artist, who really spurred this whole wonderful process of. The Samul cry of the shed that we've constructed in the Connections Gallery is of course a museum in itself and that he transported the contents of the museum from the big shed into his little shed in his back garden, talking to Jean, showing her around the show yesterday, his, his, his partner, um, that effectively people came from all around the world to look at it in the garden shed. So the idea of the museum in the museum raises lots of questions about what a museum can be. And then for Dan as a curator, talking about actually trying to work out what being a curator is, good. I've been in Den's shed and actually I recorded him in that shed so it was bringing back memories of when you know, I, I met Den and his story so nice exhibition. Yeah. I have a lot of interest in the content actually from Den's collection and obviously Alistair 
from the Airship Heritage Trust has been a godsend in terms of making sense of it and uh, helping us interpret that material and help catalogue it with Lydia. Um, I think for the Airship community itself, they obviously very keen to honour Dan. He did so much to help that kind of archive develop and that the website, the AHT website is fantastic and is a resource in itself. Knowing the study and being in there and talking to Dan, knowing him for over sort of 25 years, that's where we would sit, talk and he would share his knowledge and his passion for airships and the interest. To me, seeing it again and the detail it's almost like you've transported it from where it was to exactly where it or where it is now. Piece by piece, it is absolutely fantastic. I found it quite emotional when I first saw it, to the level of detail which has been recreated. I can't believe it's a recreation. To me, it's the real thing. Every step into an imagined heaven. He's got a little engine going on in his mind. And because, you know, when you work in the film game, you've got to have that engine going all the time with vision, sound, images, and the way he's pieced it all together is within the modern look. The image, the sound, is brought the past into a, a distant future. And it's just put it all into one big perspective. So, yeah, I think I'd probably sit really and watch it again and, and then get more into it. The hairs were standing up on my arms because it was, it was quite, it was, it was quite ethereal and creepy. The music was great, I enjoyed that as well. And you know, how, you know, the people becoming, you know, back part of the, of, you know, the air, the environment, gravity and all that kind of thing. Oh yeah, I enjoyed it, it was good lovely hearing younger people get excited about it and listening to sort of old generation stories but then you know it, they'll be the new airship dreamers of the future so that's really what I'm hoping for so yeah I really really enjoyed today and it's just been a brilliant marvellous opportunity to share with everyone. It was exceptionally clever um, from a creative graphic artistic dramatic point of view and um, I mean it, it, I think it had a sufficient uh, number of images of the airship itself now I, I, I did, en did enjoy it very much indeed I mean a big thing that I wanted to do I really wanted to get into the sheds and get the sound of the sheds which we, we couldn't do but I think we've kind of we found other ways to, to make that happen it was a very intense, immersive experience, and I liked the room, I liked the carpets as they were cut up as sections of the world, and, and the deck chairs, so it was, it was much better than the normal sort of going into a gallery, sitting on, a, on the floor or sitting on a hard bench. So welcome everyone, this is part of the Fun Palaces, it's all about Cardington and the airship and there is a huge one in there that Shortstown Primary were involved in the project. There's no right or wrong way, when you're decorating just be aware that this is going to be the bottom, you might want to start by decorating your tail. So decorate that and then it can stand up while you decorate the, the body of your airship. Do you need any other colours? Have you got all the right colours? If you need extra colours, give me a shout. You can use whatever colours you want. You can mix up colours. You can add patterns. I tore up all the tissue paper because it was easier. And then some of the shapes I cut out, so like the circles and things I cut out. I really enjoyed that you had the freedom to create what you wanted to create. And there wasn't like a set thing to do. I was trying to do a funny face with, and it turned out I did a cape and a lot of other things on it. It was going to be a lot of patchwork um, colours, so like black and purple and green. I was thinking that would be like a halloween -y one. I enjoyed that your imagination could run wild and you could have as much fun as you like. 
I'd love to see um, airships up in the sky again. I really, really would. It would be amazing and a really fantastic um, way to, to continue the history of the airship. So it would be lovely if we could see airships again. I've always said this is, this is a way forward. It's a green energy. The, the, the new airships are electric motors now. So it's a new energy. And I don't see why they shouldn't. You know, freight, massive freight they can carry. And going into places that you would never be able to go at, at, at certain speeds. I think it'd be brilliant. I think that after what we've just been through, people are, lo are looking far more at sustainability. It's something that has been around for, the idea of sustainability in airships has been around for the last 20, 30 years, but it's never been taken seriously. Now, ecological travel, I think there is a growing demand for it. People are looking at sustainability. You've got the concept of Airlander who is looking at um, Sort of luxury tours which is going back to where we were in the 1930s and I think that yeah I think there'll be a place for it finally after all these years. The Airship Dreams project itself has, has kind of seriously to sort of try to work with different age ranges, different communities of people that might not normally be that interested in art. Hopefully we'll take them on a journey to then want to see the, the, the more experimental stuff. I think that's been part of our strategy on the way. Stream God.